All right, well, <clears throat> our two speakers tonight obviously need no introduction for many of you, but I will try to do this as eloquently as possible and as they deserve. Um, Claudia Esslinger, Professor of Art, has taught at Kenyon since 1984. Currently, she teaches video art, digital imaging, new media, and installation. Her own work focuses on video and installation art featuring visceral, sculptural props and experimental forms. She frequently collaborates with dancers, musicians, writers, and scientists to develop new work, which has been shown in film festivals, live performance, and gallery installations, both nationally and internationally. Royal Rhodes, the Donald L. Rogan Professor Emeritus, taught global religion, spiritual literature, and death and dying for almost 40 years at Kenyon College. His poems have appeared in Red Wolf Editions, Snakeskin Poetry, Chola Needles, and the Montreal Review, among others in, in print and online. He's also done a number of poetry and art collaborations with the Catbird Press in North Carolina, and the Gun Gallery's Art of Tree. Claudia and Royal have recently collaborated on this series, Specimens and Reflections, born out of an extended stay in Italy. The work features panoramas of ecclesiastical architecture, curled and twisted into forms mimicking those of natural history. Specimens. These images are accompanied by poetic reflections. Sorry. Thank you, Claudia and Royal, for joining us tonight. And I will turn it over to you to discuss your series. As soon as I tell my husband to stop calling me. <laughs> All right. Uh, there we go. Um, hi. It's so good to see you all. It's a very exciting to be here. And uh, Roy and I have been working together on this project for, what, almost two years. Yeah. And we have it uh, up. Well, we just took it down, but it was up for a month and a half uh, in a nearby gallery, which was great because actually a lot of people got to see it that we love, a lot of people around here. Um, but since you all weren't there, um, we decided that after Tristan asked us, of course, that we would really like to share it with you online. And so here is a view of uh, sort of the presentation we gave at the gallery as a gallery talk, but also with pictures, with images. Um, so we are going to now share our screen and see how that goes. Just a minute. I have to do my thing here. Um, wait a Desktop two. <laughs> of course, they can't figure it out. Oh, that's one. Desktop one. Sure. Can you see it now? Can you guys see? We're floating around the gallery. Okay. So I'm going to shrink that up. Uh, and I'm going to move to just talk about the, the project. So this project is called Specimens and Reflections, and uh, it grew out of uh, my experience being the director of the Kenyan Rome program in 2019. And I know Meme is here. I don't know if anybody else who was on that trip is here, um, but here they are in one of the uh, trolley or trams in Rome. Meme's on the right there. Um, we had a great time together, and I really appreciate their uh, energy and enthusiasm and creativity uh, as we were there working and having fun together. Uh, let's see. I have to click on the right thing here. Here's some of my other colleagues who I'd also like to thank um, who enabled this program. Uh, the program actually started by Melissa DeBacchus um, developing it and Kristen Van Osdale teaching in it as well. And it was largely an art history program for a while. Uh, and then for a while it became uh, 
part of the general college and many, uh, some different departments taught in the program, but it came back to being centered in art and studio uh, and art history both take turns now leading the program. Um, I also appreciate the help of my husband, Jack, and the rest of my family. Um, Jack helped me source some of the churches in this project. Um, he, while I was teaching, he would go out and scout out the next location. And my daughter, Rachel, who was visiting here, and her daughter, Maitena, um, were also uh, able to help in the installation of the show, which was great. And my deepest thanks, of course, is to Royal Roads. Um, his lovely words and thoughts made these images come to life and in many ways completed the journey that I began by making these images. So I'll briefly describe the program for those of you who don't know about it. Um, I, I already told you that it started in art history, um, but when we go to Rome, we actually teach two classes and the third level of our engagement is to be the director of the program. And this is an example of the classroom that we used for the past several years. It hasn't always been the case. This was uh, several years ago. And it's uh, currently in the Accent Center. Accent is an educational group that facilitates these types of uh, experiences. And it is housed in Piazza dell'Orologio, which um, is really centrally located. Um, we took two class trips in 2019. One was to Venice to experience the Venice Biennale, which is amazing. If you get to go anytime, I encourage you to do so. And then we took one to Sicily where we went to Taormina. We tried to go to Mount Etna, but got kind of rained out. Um, we went to Ortesia uh, and Agrigento. So during this time in Italy, I was able to visit these churches multiple times in between class activities, of course, and that was the beginning of this project. Um, I hope you will also enjoy some of the images and sounds uh, I collected as we move through this presentation. I won't just talk the whole time, um, but this uh, next slide is full of some of the birds that we encountered in Rome. Is it playing? Should be, there we go. These are some birds swarming outside of the Vatican, actually. And we'll move to the next slide. This is called a murmuration of starlings. Go ahead, Roy. They descend upon the eternal city over the egg-shaped domes of churches and the dissolving marble debris of empire. Light in the winter evening loses the soft yellow color of butter and bright lemons that bathe the monuments. A storm of starlings agitates the covens of stray cats and strollers crossing piazzas to escape the vast fouling that coats paving stones, cars, and the elegant clothes of Romans and rich tourists sheltering under open umbrellas. The sheer cloud of black specks 
after consuming olives from trees in the countryside, a light here sheltered from enemy owls. They are an ever undulating sky-wide sculpture, floating gauze scarves, a murmuration falcons failed to rout in exile. We walk gingerly holding each other upon the slick steps bound by the mildly chilly air and fear of falling in falling apart. The starlings startled by distress calls, municipal workers blast into treetops, flee, and the bleached sky is deserted. They looked like small clots of black blood, omens any ancient priest could have read in the arrhythmia of our hearts. Eighty-nine days. That's the limit on a tourist visa. But this was way more than a tourist visit. My memories of previous visits muted in comparison. We lived in the center of the old city, folded into the nose of the Tiber on a cobbled street you see here, midway between the Pantheon and the Vatican. We had time for a few day and weekend side trips outside of Rome as well. And with time and location on our side, I no longer felt the urgency of a tourist quickly gathering a limited number of experiences. No longer did the effort extended to reach a destination overshadow the luminous and surprising goal. I could walk to the Pantheon in the early morning. I could sit through the resonant music of a mass. I could return to feel it rain through the oculus. The visits to many churches stirred surprising emotional responses in me. I thought I would approach them with artistic and historical analysis as I think I had in the past. I imagined they would function as great installation art projects, which is one metric through which I perceived space. I imagined I would be objective. But as I walked past a sometimes unassuming facade and entered through an added wooden vestibule, I was often overwhelmed with wonder at the height of the vaulted ceiling, the intimacy of a side chapel, the intricate detail in the tessellated floor. I could hear the resonance of the space around me where whispers floated from across the domed ceiling. I imagined the marble folds over Santa Cecilia as velvet under the whorls of my fingers. I felt a sense of magic. I wondered if it was spiritual. How could I remember this? Should I just sit there and drink it in? Yes, but then forget later. How could I play with my art practice in these spaces? How could I even take in the amount of detail around me? If I gathered images from every angle, could I see the detail later? Could I remember specific images better than my onboard computer would allow? I had been making panoramic images of landscapes where multiple individual frames are combined together afterward. Using multiple shots means the detail, the pixel count can be rather high. So I could gather more detail this way. What would happen if a three dimensional space that surrounded the viewer were stitched together on a flat plane? Sant Ivo alla Sapienza here was the first image to be made in this quest. I love this space. We went a long time there and after all, sapienza means wisdom. 
The church was small and refreshingly white after visiting so many places laden with gold. It was architecturally stunning, yet elegant in its simplicity. Baromini ended up being one of my favorite architects from this point on. If you look closely, you can see Jack in this piece and many others. <laughs> I don't know if you can see my mouse, but he's right here in the lower right. Okay. After shooting about 30 images over my head, around the walls, in back of me, I returned to our apartment and asked Photoshop to join me. I think of this as a collaboration for although I shot the images and chose which ones to offer up for the process, Photoshop's algorithms made multiple choices about how to join the images, how to stretch the edges and develop the shape. I love sharing this power with another entity. It creates what I call a dialogue with the work where I can't preconceive and dictate what the final result must be. In many cases, the jumbled three-dimensional form twisted and curled in on itself when made into a two-dimensional image. These puzzles of perception reminded me of natural history specimens popular in the 19th century. As multiple scenes folded into these coiled and rounded forms, the relationship to fossils became more clear. How curious to distill forms of sophisticated architecture and art into a fossil shape. How interesting that the church itself was built with the fossil encrusted stones to begin with. These panoramic images are of churches that are indeed cultural, historical, religious, and political specimens of their time. And now they are artifacts and specimens of my experience with them. As the images developed, the amount of detail and the desire to reference the enormity of the experience led to the use of this adhesive paper to mount directly on the wall. The embedded images could then evoke the frescoed and painted walls of many churches. And there's my daughter Rachel in the middle helping us adhere those images. The poems float next to their counterparts on slim shelves and the plate number from the folio, the book that we made completes the connection. The smaller framed pieces came after the first set of images in the book and they were made in a further step of software collaboration where two separate panoramas were morphed and composited together to create a separate reference to ecclesiastical architecture. So uh, obviously in this, the Santa Cecilia on the left and San Ignacio on the right combined to make this much more um, composited image below. Here's another example. This is the Pantheon and San Giovanni um, Baptismal. And this is Sant'Ivo and San Carlino del Quadro Frantani. Well, what, what role did these churches play in their original context? What role do they play today? The early and continued use of these churches is complex. They offered hope in an afterlife with soaring spaces patterned with angels and deities. They advertised their patronage from diverse powers of popes and princes. They provided illustrations of religious doctrine to congregants within a communal gathering space. 
and sometimes they provided physical help for those in need. That's the question I'm always asking. What about those less fortunate? How might this gold have been used to support them? And I ask that of myself. How does my art help the world at all? Should I focus more on physical needs? I have some answers, but the questions always resurface. So I looked for evidence of churches and who were showing concern for those in need of help. And I found some humble places like San Estacio near the Pantheon, where I walked in on a dinner to serve some who were hungry rather than a group of tourists with cameras. On two Sundays, we were welcomed into another tiny sanctuary of modest means in Piazza di Pasquino, fully alive with an African immigrant congregation. The service was clearly Catholic, multilingual, and rhythmic with drums and dancing. I don't have detailed panoramas of these places because I didn't want to intrude on what was happening inside, but they certainly left their impression inside of me. The more places I visited, the more I experienced both awe and reflection. The magic of many spaces still captivated me, nearly taking away my breath at times. I found myself sitting in the pews or even on the floor, considering the journey of my own faith, how it had ebbed and changed. When I returned home, I shared these images with Royal Roads. He began thinking of poems to accompany the panoramas and I was thrilled again to share this process with someone else where I could dialogue about image and meaning. The collaborative process allows for a result that is greater than the sum of the participants. Roy's knowledge as a professor of religion at Kenyon for many years, the experience of his own personal journey and his poetic prowess have enri enriched this project immensely. Together, we decided to create a folio book as a container for our project. There, the poems and images could live side by side. And I'm enormously grateful for this collaborative experience. Roy? Well, let me add my thanks to all those who made the exhibition in Mount Vernon at the Schnormeyer Gallery possible, and to friends who encouraged me along the way um, they might have had second thoughts after they saw the project, but especially to Claudia, who kindly invited me in my retirement to collaborate with her on this enriching creative project. This is a picture of San Anselmo on the Aventine in, in Rome. Claudia's astounding images transported me back to prior visits to Rome and other places in Italy years ago. I was a classics major in college. The college I went to wouldn't give you a Bachelor of Arts unless you took Latin and Greek. And I was deeply drawn to the treasures of Roman art, history and architecture, and then into the development of Western Christianity. While I was there on my last visit, I stayed in the Benedictine Arch Abbey of San Anselmo on the crown of the Aventine Hill overlooking the Tiber. San Anselmo is a site of many high society weddings in Rome, and you can see why with this picture of their chapel. Um, there is, don't tell anyone, a swimming pool next to the chapel. I was taking an afternoon swim and just walked across the chapel with my trunks and my towel, just as the high society wedding was coming out. So I wasn't sure who was more startled um, by that. But also in this neighborhood are the embassies of the 
many nations that uh, Italy is in diplomatic relationship to. And it's right beside the place that is the sovereign military order of Malta. Many of you may uh, know that famous uh, picture of the keyhole. So you can see three countries, Malta, Italy, and the Vatican at the same time. Luckily, I was able to call forth from memory prompted by these panoramas, many details of churches, shrines, and basilicas. And in the photography, I found even more treasures to discover and reflect upon. I was also entertained by the monks at Subiaco, close to the Villa of Nero, and visited the site where Saint Benedict first fled the world into a deep cave in the mountains. One feels the junction of the temporal and eternal in that cave. For me, it was even more uh, an experience because when the good monks at the monastery at the bottom of the hill heard I was il professore, uh, they gave me many cups of grappa, which I dutifully drank and then tried to make my way up the, the remainder of the mountain. Luckily, there was an Irish monk there at the cave who took pity on me. A warning to those who are traveling uh, amongst monasteries. The hospitality is beyond belief. Um, the poet Alice Oswald has insightfully reminded us that poetry is the great unsettler. Poetry is the great unsettler. Poetry, like all art, presses against borderlines. You can see this in the shape poem in front of you. The too familiar, beauty too neatly packaged. It should reimagine things take risks and at its best instill a radical reorientation that makes us co-creators of the world through the word, just as Genesis tells us. Poetry is a half open door, a half open door inviting us into an unknown. That is what I found in crafting these poems about the defamiliarized panoramas of church interiors Claudia produced. I thought I knew from my studies in the classics and Western church history. This collaboration shakes and stretches for me and makes new in startling ways that poetry is best suited to capture, perhaps we can all recall the works of poets and writers such as Keats. And on this day, we remember the death of Keats in Rome near the Spanish steppes in 1821, but also Shelley and Byron, Poe, Hawthorne, Goethe, Henry James, Dickens, James Fenimore Cooper, and others who became enamored with Rome. We have only to remember that Roma contains the Latin word for love, amor. In the church of San Andrea del Valle, Puccini, my favorite, set the first act of his opera, Tosca, the impassioned story of tragic lovers even the villain, Scarpia, sacrilegiously says, Tosca, you make me forget even God. Such is the passions of Rome, or as my family like to joke, because they know my passion for Rome, all roads lead to Rome. How do you interpret the weight of meaning presented in multiple visions of the sacred? What moderns might term as power constructed over millennia 
And yet this vision is embodied in the ordinary. Even the angels and demons that should terrify are depicted as if mirroring our own human bodies. Through language, poets have hunted the holy and tried to domesticate what they think is knowable, but what may never be known in attempting to make visible the invisible. And sometimes for me, walking into these often vast spaces, I sensed the mystery of the sacred outside my grasp. What we are always failing to understand, this mystery rewards with absence, distance, and a greater silence. And yet here is still a presence. For the last 1500 years, people have flocked to this place to think and to pray. The artists who flourished in these holy places, where as T.S. Eliot said, prayer has been valid, saw art as a kind of prayer in parentheses. This joint project, let me be drawn into these visual compositions that contort, reshape, and realign borders, perspectives, colorization, coffered domes, entablatures, the theatrical undulations of concave and convex walls. I see that incarnated in these poems, some reflecting the shapes of the visual images. I think of my words as light reflecting, refracting tesserae that compose mosaics covering uh, an inner world at once eternally static and endlessly in motion. The content of the poems reflects an underlying questioning and it is an experience of what I call faithful doubt. Poetry should always evoke questions and responses from the wondering and wandering heart. Art in its many forms does not end with a period, but with a question mark. These sites like St. Peter's here have seen the rise and decline of empires, war, civil strife, fire, plague, the neglect of the poor, the rejection of the other from behind gilded and bejeweled enclosures. And yet as here at Assisi with the statue of the defeated young warrior Francis. We see there is something deeper in the generous lives of the saints commemorated, the martyrs and the servants of humanity, secular as well as religious, who lived, resisted and died in service to the world. Theirs is the story of release from the prisons of wealth and power to not be possessed by one's possessions, asking us to look for a way to transform our existence into living fire. I'll end my remarks with a poem that responds directly to the even more experimental images Claudia has crafted. These are not contained in our book, but resonate, resonate with its widening reach. The eyes see through the heart. The raised lens layers a palimpsest from the translucent atmosphere, the pigmented, dramatic, silvery ceilingscape 
a lattice of interlocking arches like limbs that look no more than thin filaments bearing heavy domes. As if weightless, their white shadows compose theatrical Baroque that make ridges ripple in riddles of faith. The camera soaked up afternoon light and my questions about the fatal role played by any infinity. Will the myself that looks up into autobiographies of spirit diffuse like these colors, a paraphrase of light or does altered height entice my eyes to where wild things are, where I had missed what breaks at last into being. The photographs fleshly tumult of the unknown makes a marriage of avoidance and puzzled adoration that vibrates illegible energy and I become one with it at last. Well, that is the end of our presentation tonight. Um, we will uh, happily talk to you now and answer questions. Thank you so much for being part of our um, conversation. Part of our collaboration is you. Thanks. All right, everybody. <laughs> now you have to ask questions. <laughs> if you want, you don't have to, obviously. Anybody have a question? I could tell more stories about traveling across Europe at monasteries. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe for another time. <laughs> so I have a question. Um, the images are, are, are beautiful, um, breathtaking. Were there other architectural photos that you took? I mean, outside of, of cathedrals were, you know, bridges or other historic structures that you did this technique with? Not so much, um, a little bit. For instance, in the Vatican Museum, um, I went to a library. Uh, I think I have three or four other examples and I have about three times as many um, churches, but these were the ones that came out the best. And they also had the most detail too. That's a good question. I'm curious about um, how you were approaching the poems, Royal. Was, uh, were you using sort of as your touchstone, um, just simply looking at Claudia's works that she had um, handed off to you, or were you uh, bringing in your own experience, or or some other um, some other avenue? A good question. Um, yes, Claudia's uh, images um, triggered so many of my own memories of these of these places, and it was fortunate that we had overlapped in most of the um, of the places, um, but. Um, um, but trying to do what I, uh, for many years, told my students to do, do your homework. So I went back and tried to find information as much as possible. And sometimes wording and images that I had missed in, um, uh, in Claudia's uh, um, uh, work, um, you know, 
came to the fore. And uh, so I uh, worked on that. What, um, what happened with the initial stage was I had written poems about being in Rome um, and things. And I shared those with Claudia and it became evident very quickly that wasn't going to work. It had to be an engagement with um, just how uh, the images had been transformed, how the places had been transformed by her artistry. Um, and uh, so that was a jumping off place um, uh, for me. All right, well, I'll jump in with one more. <laughs> um, I'm curious as to whether or not you, um, did y'all critique each other and then adjust your works or was it more about um, your independent vision and keeping them separate and creating the relationship by placing them together? Well, from my, from my perspective, it, there was real uh, give and take, not only about the poetry, but about the, uh, the images. Claudia, is extraordinarily collaborative, um, saying, "Do you think this works? What about what about this this version um, uh, of things?" So we we did go back and forth um, uh, that way. Um, poetry is often looked upon as a pretty um, solitary um, uh, work, but uh, I had had some experience at, at Kenyon uh, fairly recently with a group of students who were uh, student curators at uh, the Gunn Gallery who put together um, a program and an exhibition called The Art of Trees. And so working with those students and the images they had brought together, I began writing poetry uh, for that. I think I wrote about 16 uh, poems. They, they had three of them on, on display. Um, and I've told other people, uh, if they're interested, uh, I've got another 15,000 poems in bins here in the office. Uh, and the alum said, oh, great. If you send me one every day, that's until March 23rd, 2086. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was, this was fantastic. I'm particularly curious about the process of how you were superimposing the one image of the church over the other. I mean, it kind of reminds you of looking into a puddle and you're seeing some sort of reflection. Can you say a little bit more, Claudia, about how you chose which ones to put together or kind of how that played out? I mean, they were fascinating because your brain is working so hard to try to connect things or figure out how it fits together. But it, it was like hard work, but it was really kind of cool. I think there there's a conception that um, an artist actually figures it out. <laughs> I think I discover it. Um, so it's a little bit more, uh, the, the initial images that are shaped were the ones I described where I would take um, many images and ask Photoshop, why don't you try these 20? Why don't you try these 20? And whichever one looked the best, I would say, okay, I agree. <laughs> um, and then I did fiddle with them a little bit, but I, I didn't um, overly, uh, you know, change them. And then what I decided to do after that, I think is what you're referring to. And that is taking two of those and deciding, well, what happens if they go together? Um, and the way I did that was something referring to my video experience, and that is I put them in After Effects, which is a, a special effects program, and I, I put the, a transition morph on them and let it play out. And when I hit a frame that I really liked, I took a freeze frame of that and then brought that into Photoshop and let uh, Photoshop fill in some of the areas that were blank after that. If I liked it, I kept it. If I didn't like it, I tried it again. Um, and then I enlarged them with another software program called Gigapixel because <laughs> they were very small. So, I mean, it, 
it was sort of a series of working with several different kinds of of software and going back and forth to see what, what worked. I have to uh, point out to folks that uh, Sister Gina is a Benedictine um, and a marvelous icon writer. Um, and if you're ever on campus, again, in the Church of the Holy Spirit, on the Western Wall is a beautiful icon of Saint Anselm, San Anselmo, that, uh, that she did. And, and you, you spent a lot of time at Santa Sabina on the Aventine too, didn't you? I studied in Rome when I was at Kenyon. I went through Trinity College, Connecticut's program at that time, but I actually was just there last month and it was lovely to see these images again. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. So I gradu graduated in 82, so I missed, missed Claudia entirely. Mm -hmm. And after tonight's um, presentation, I feel really sad about that, but so happy to have sat through this, but it's wonderful to see Royal again. And I would love to, is there a way for us to get a copy of your folio? Oh, yes. So I, um, we, we produced it ourselves through Blurb. And uh, if you go to my website, claudiaesslinger.com, at the bottom of the homepage, there's a link to the Blurb um, account, the Blurb page that you buy it on. So it's sort of a produce on demand situation. There's also all of these images I showed you are on that front page also. So you can look at them that way. It was so good to see Hillary. <laughs> <laughs> Wish I did get to know you. <laughs> Well, I will be coming for the reunion, so maybe I'll, if you're on campus, I'll get mm -hmm. to see you. Okay. Any other questions? You don't have to answer ask a question. But you Hi. Can. I have a Hi, question. Liz. More come. Hi, Claudia. Hi, Royal. Um, I really love the 3D nature of the images. Um, so even though they were flat and two-dimensional, it really I, took me into the space and kind of created this both realistic but also fantastical space and world. Um, and so it really gave a feeling of the space. Were you, when you were creating those, were you surprised by that? Like to come into this, I just, I was so surprised by how three-dimensional they were and, and how you were able to create that. And, this is more a comment than a question, but if you could little talk a little bit more about that experience of just put, being able to pull the viewer into this two-dimensional image. I think I consciously looked at the altar of every place and said, no, <laughs> um, that everybody has a postcard of that image, right? And what I don't see often it is looking up. And that actually was what was kind of astounding to me, the, the looking up. So I guess that was a bit of a conscious decision that that was where the deepest space was. Um, you know, I really did feel like I wanted to see everything and I couldn't see it in the time given. And you know, part of me, I know many people who don't bring a camera with them because it, it's an interference, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a fake facade that keeps you from feeling reality. But having a camera has often given me courage um, and allowed me to actually see in a different way, even though some of it is after the fact. Um, I remember <laughs> renting a helicopter in Seattle, Maddie, um, to go out over Puget Sound. And when I got there and got in and realized there was no door on the helicopter and that there was only a, one small, not over the shoulder seat belt and, the, and I wanted to get the image of the water so he would bank, I realized, well, I would only do this with a camera in my hand, right? <laughs> so I think, um, I think some of that courage, some of that adventure, some of that idea making 
happens through the facility of a technology for me. Um, and whatever that is, good or bad, that that's what my experience is. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> But one to follow that up, do you ever feel like, and the images were so beautiful and pristine and detailed, do you ever feel that there's too much detail? It, it's something I struggle with because I've in recent years used film cam, mm -hmm. film, like film, film cameras a lot. Yeah. And I, I'm so, I kind of, I don't know, I, I struggle with that dichotomy between, you know, you, like a little bit of haziness and then also just the detail that you can get with digital. Well, you notice I did say that I was relieved when I got into a white space. That's yes, yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there were ways in which it's too much. It's kind of like being living in the middle of the Baroque, right? Um, I don't, I mean, I don't, what I'm imagining is that these places were built layer upon layer mm -hmm. with, artist upon artist, just adding, 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 right? So it's not necessarily um, part of the integral baseline of each place, but these that, that it's almost like it's a collaboration of all those artists too, many of whom we don't even know, <laughs> right? We, they were um, assistants to assistants of some artist or architect. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And yeah, beautiful work. Love the poems too. All really great. Great. Did um, Holly have a question or comment? Yes. I see Holly's hand is raised. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much for this beautiful way to spend an evening. And I just wanted to ask both of you about how um, the people in the spaces became part of this project. I know, Claudia, you mentioned a space where you chose not to shoot the church, maybe in part because of how the space was being used by the people in it. But I kind of wonder about the process and how the people in the space affected trying to document the space. And then uh, thinking about, too, when you're kind of putting, trying to put the images together. And then, um, Roy, I was wondering whether that idea of the people in the space or the people in the images, did that come into your process of writing about the spaces? Well, do you want to go first or? Um, I'm gonna say something about your poems. Um, oh. I, you know, Roy would write several things and I would really gravitate to the ones that had a human story. And, um, Similarly, when I took these images, occasionally I would try to leave out the ones that had people in them. And it just became a little artificial. And also it was kind of funny to see the, you know, people taking pictures all around them, including me, but I have pictures of people taking pictures, um, the whole tourist thing. Um, it also ended up being kind of an interesting uh, record of my husband being in these spaces because he was always with me. And so if I did the whole church, he was there someplace. Um, I also, because I lived there for those three months, I basically could go really early in the morning to a place or as soon as it opened and often there weren't people there. And if it wasn't a famous church, there weren't people there. So it maybe is a record of that too, tourism. Yeah. And, yeah. We had joked that uh, we should have had a scavenger uh, hunt who could pick out Jack in each of the photographs uh, uh, around. Um, and, and, and for me, it was um, you know, a kind of reminder that I was putting myself in the place of those people who were in Claudia's uh, images. Um, a, a, another layer of interpretation, and she was talking before about how from um, the ancient world, the Etruscans to the Romans, to the medievals, to uh, the Baroque, to uh, the moderns, layer upon layer, 
Well, all of those human experiences were also kind of resonating ar around and, uh, and, and the tourist figures or the people praying in, in these spaces gave me a sense of proportion um, as well. These are vast spaces, but as I said in one of the poems, it's all um, using the human figure as the, um, as the modality for understanding the vastness uh, around. That's what I tried to do with the poems. There was a vast difference for me if it were, were people praying in a space versus the tourists with the cameras. Mm -hmm. So I would say I did not take pictures of people praying in the space um, if I could help it. But, um, and that's why I don't have pictures of the inside of the African congregation or the Eustachio. Um, actually I did later on get a very brief shot of inside of Eustachio when nobody was there. But um, there, there was a sense that what is the purpose of their being there and trying to respect that. And I loved uh, that uh, Claudia had also recorded the, the natural sounds around. So it wasn't just human traffic or uh, things, but also the birds and the squirrels and um, the cats of her own, <laughs> uh, uh, everything. Uh, uh, together and uh, that that vision of one whole creation together, I, I think, uh, uh, made a real impression on me. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thinking about all the various um, people and other creatures that have populated those spaces and imparted meaning to them as well. Thank you. Mm. Well, it seems like maybe that's mm. the end of the questions. Oh, are, you have you one more? are you imagining a follow-up collaborative effort? <laughs> well, I do have an envelope of poems Roy gave me when we finished this. And I said, I'm gonna look at those. Um, we were thinking about what would happen if it started the other way. You know, what if, if it starts with Roy's poems and then I do something in response? I just haven't gotten to that yet. In the, meantime, in the meantime, I'm doing a collaborative project with a Kenyan senior uh, who spent uh, the past semester in, in Rome, but focusing more on the classical and modern um, uh, period. Um, there's just something about, I, I think art is basically collaborative. Um, and um, uh, but my, my dream is to have a, a space where there be images, poetry, music, and dance all going on simultaneously. Um, and maybe. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, we appreciate all of you. You're welcome to write to us. Uh, we're still at our Kenyan.edu. <laughs> so thank you. It'll be lovely to hear from you. So uh, um, you're, you're uh, what MLL calls um, the, the native informants <laughs> out, in the, out in the world. <laughs> so uh, keep in touch and uh, know we're thinking of you always. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks.